item for this room. We're at four o'clock. Uh, I'll give the speaker about a ten minute warning, so if you see me waiting, like this is not for anybody else. Again, I'm Michelle Butler. I'm in NCSA. I'm in charge of the storage environment for NCSA. So if there's any questions about storage or file systems or anything like that, you can ask me. Uh, I've been at NCSA 26 years. I'm the old woman of storage. Um, <laughs> Hi everyone, um, my name is Ivan Rykov. I am a postdoc at the Showtest lab at Stanford University. And today I will talk about our work on neuronal modeling using blue waters. So the fundamental problem that we're interested in, in understanding is episodic memory, which is to say is the memory that associates places with events. So most of us probably associate the Sun River Resort with the Blue Water Symposium. And uh, so this cognitive process is called um, episodic memory. And uh, from a basic science point of view, um, neuroscientists have long observed that in experiments where they have uh, an animal run through a, some kind of trajectory or uh, just exploring open space, they have noticed that certain kinds of neurons only fire, are only active in certain locations. So in this example, um, Every tick here represents an electrical pulse sent out by a neuron, which is how neurons communicate. And we can see that the red neuron, for example, is primarily active in this area, so it's associated with this location. The green neuron is primarily active in this area, uh, which it follows some kind of Gaussian distribution, so it is associated with this green part. Um, and then uh, uh, another, so this is how uh, memories are formed, but another aspect of this which is still unresolved in neuroscience is that when the animal pauses and it is maybe planning its future route or thinking about past experiences, there's the phenomenon called replay, which is a very rapid replay of the sequence of neurons that was activated during the trajectory. So this is not fully understood, but uh, scientists think that this is probably how memories, short-term memories, are transferred to the neocortex um, for long-term storage. The neocortex is where most of the high-level cognitive processes occur. So we are building computational models of, of the rodent brain uh, and the hippocampus specifically originating in the brain. And we hope that this will provide a framework for understanding how these sequences of uh, neuronal activation really occur. Also, how the overall network dynamics oscillate periodically. And finally, how, what are the mechanisms that underlie this replay? How does it happen that the exact same sequence of cells can be replayed uh, uh, during planning or um, basically rest when the, mo the animal is not moving? Uh, so we are primarily interested in the hippocampus, which is a region in the brain. This is in the rat brain here. This is in the human brain here. Um, the hippocampus is closely interconnected with the region of the new cortex, which is called the entorhinal cortex. Uh, basically, the fundamental understanding is, is that there are multiple sensory streams arriving via the entorhinal cortex into the hippocampus. The hippocampus does some kind of decorrelation and association uh, with, with the particular places at a particular times. Uh, and here is a little bit of a simplified circuit. So the entorhinal cortex is divided into anatomical layers. So it is thought that it provides input from layer two into the hippocampus, which has three primary regions, dentate gyrus, CA3, CA1. The textbook view is that CA3 is, has a lot of recurrent connectivity, which allows memories to be formed because the recurrent connectivity allows the same signal to persist. And then the CA1 region is the output, which feeds back into the neocortex and uh, presumably transfer the memories. This, though, is, is not exactly correct because there's a lot of anatomical complexity. There are back projections. Uh, there are multiple redundant connections from the cortex into the hippocampus. And there's a lot of other details that, that we are slowly uh, starting to understand. Um, so 
for every oh, every kind of circuit I will show, we should assume probably there's some redundant another circuit that uh, has partially overlapping function. Uh, and then uh, another very important aspect of hippocampal modeling is that the sequences that occur um, in vivo that have been observed in experiments are very precisely timed because we don't want groups of neurons to get activated at the same time, which would cause different sequences and different memory traces uh, to interfere with one another. So the hippocampal circuitry is organized in terms of principal cells, which are called pyramidal cells. They're the most numerically dominant type and interneurons, which are connected in such a way that they discharge the, pri the principal cells and they sort of reduce and modulate their activity. So the uh, theory is that each interneuron has, each groups of interneurons have different time constants. So they slow down the principal cells and allow them to find different times and different phases when they're active so as to minimize interference and to maximize information encoding. And furthermore, the hippocampus is very famous for generating very strong electrical fields from uh, the activity of its neurons. So these fields, or field potentials as they're called, are also another metric of the periodic oscillatory activity of the network. So everything that, the, the way we define the activity of neurons is defined in terms of the phase of the field potential oscillation. So this set of neurons have particular phases, which I think is about zero degrees, then 60 de degrees, 180 degrees, and so on. So the, these are the main principles that are taught how the hippocampus distinguishes different places at different times. Um, and then there are um, the principles through which the neurons are connected with each other. Uh, there are several kinds of feedback loops that are formed. Generally speaking, we have feed-forward inhibition and feedback inhibition. The idea is here that there's a signal arriving from another part of the brain. It activates both the principal cell and some interneurons. These interneurons are going to um, initiate processes that discharge the principal cell and reduce its activity. So in, in a sense, they provide a modulatory effects. Feedback inhibition is just a negative feedback loop. This uh, cell starts to fire. It activates these interneurons. In turn, they provide negative feedback and slow it down. So this, even though it looks simple and maybe intuitive to engineers and computer scientists, it actually, neuroscientists have spent maybe 50 years trying to understand the exact details of the biology underlying these connections. And it's really only been possible to build models of the entire network just in the past 10 years. Most of neuroscience basically has, has been just studying these simple circuits in individual cells. But to understand really the whole network, we have to understand these uh, small circuits. Okay, and then, so this is one of the network structure of one, one of our models. Uh, it consists of uh, 300,000 principal pyramidal cells. This is about the number of cells that is found in the rat uh, hippocampus. And it also consists of realistic numbers of interneurons. Uh, as I explained, they, those modulate the activity of the principal cells. Uh, here I'm showing that there are eight different species of interneurons. Uh, neuroscientists have actually identified over 20, 20 different species in this region of the hippocampus. But some of them are similar to each other or not so much inf is known about them. So we have grouped these 20 kinds into uh, eight types for which either a lot is known or uh, they're reasonably similar that we can um, consider them the same the network is sparsely connected. So with these numbers of neurons, there's a possibility of quadrillions of connections, but it's really only 10 to 20% of the possible connectivities exist. So uh, we he here we have about 3 billion connections. Uh, there are specific uh, rules of connectivity. Uh, m some neurons prefer to contact only neurons of specific types or at specific locations. But generally speaking, the connectivity is primarily local, uh, so adjacent neurons prefer to connect e to contact each other with a few long-distance connections. So this is a generally is can be considered a small-world network for uh, those who are interested in graph theory. Um, and then the way we model the neurons themselves um, is the following: so neurons are cells that uh, have 
evolved for communication with each other. They consist of a body or soma, and then a number of anatomical projections, which are called axons and dendrites. So generally speaking, dendrites receive signals, axons send out signals. So this distributed extended spatial structure is modeled as a set of points with some topology. This is a reconstructed, a digital reconstruction of a neuron. And then each segment, each part of the um, neuronal membrane has a number of structures that are known as ion channels. The ion channels are proteins that uh, allow charged particles, ions, in and out, and that changes the membrane potential, uh, the potential difference, which in turn causes uh, the cell to either discharge or charge and then produce an electrical pulse, which is the spike, which is the principal ways of communicating. Um, a long time ago, neuroscientists realized that the um, dynamics of the ion channels can be modeled as equivalent electrical circuit, which has a time varying of time and voltage varying conductances. So essentially the entire neuron, the uh, uh, electrical activity of the entire neuron is uh, represented in these spatially extended electri electrical circuits. We have maybe on average a few hundred of these segments. Each segment has maybe uh, another hundred equations and state variables. So for a single neuron, we have on the order of 10 to 20,000 state variables and uh, uh, associated differential equations that describe the, the voltage dynamics. And furthermore, to add to the complexity, the, the way neurons connect to each other is through these uh, junctions called synapses. So when an electrical signal is sent from the body of the neuron, it reaches the end of its projection, the synaptic terminal. And this, this actually triggers a transduction sequence which converts the electrical signal to a chemical signal which releases a number of particles known as neurotransmitter which is then again transduced into electrical signal. So this is actually a fairly complex sequence and up until now we really haven't had the computational uh, ability to model the details of this. So most often we just have a simplified equation that just gives us the rise in conductance and then the decay of conductance that is associated with the uh, um, charge transfer from one neuron to another. But even with those simplified equations, we still have thousands of synapses in a typical neuron, so that adds another layer of computational complexity. So another maybe tens of thousands of state variables and equations. Uh, and then finally, we use the neuron simulator, which is the most uh, widely used simulator in computational neuroscience which allows us to create a digital representation of the neuronal structure, insert all the ion channels, equations, and state variables. And a uh, neuron allows us to characterize a neuron by simulating injecting currents and then measuring the response of the cell. And we can compare this with experimental data and make sure that this neuron behaves as it should. So if it looks like a neuron and then it responds like a neuron, so we, we consider it it's, it's a realistic representation of the biological system. Um, okay, and uh, so this is just another view of the diversity of neuronal species in one of if, uh, our published model. So this is just to indicate that the neurons have different anatomical locations and locations where they make contacts. Uh, and this, again, this is a summary slide of the work of maybe over a hundred groups over maybe 40 years. So this is a lot of many years of work that is just summarized in a single slide. But this has made possible the, the full-scale models that we are now building. Uh, we characterize, we, we build neuron models by first constructing the structure, uh, creating sort of distributions of, um, of ion channel conductances that match the experimentally reported uh, data. There are each ion channel is characterized by voltage-dependent activation and inactivation curves. And in result, different cell cells of different types can have very different responses. Some are fast spiking, some are slow spiking, uh, or can be adaptive, so the frequency changes as we're injecting more current. But all of this allows us to claim that we really represent the underlying biology very well. And very importantly, the synaptic dynamics, uh, so each connection between two neuron types is characterized by these charge transfer curves, 
which tells us the relative strength of how much one neuron can affect the behavior of another. So this is also extremely important for the network modeling. Um, so, okay, so what happens when you actually construct this network and you turn it on? Um, this is a representation of our CA1 300,000 cell model where we first provided it with a random homogeneous Poisson input. And you can see, so each dot here represents a spike, uh, uh, electrical pulse produced by a neuron. Here are the principal cells, and here are the different kinds of interneurons. And you can see immediately that there is some kind of rhythmicity to the activity of the network, uh, which is remarkable because there's no structure in the input. It's completely random. But each cell type has its own time constant and, and is active at different times. And we also, because of the field potential oscillations are so important in hippocampal modeling, we also provide an approximation of the electrical field that's generated by these cells. Here is a filtered, um, uh, the field potential filter at 4 to 10 hertz. Um, and it turns out we have a very strong oscillation in that range. The 4 to 10 hertz is actually one of the most important biophysical oscillations. It's called the theta oscillation. And it occurs during locomotion in humans and animals. Uh, this is the, in the power spectrum. We can also show that this oscillation is very sta stable. It's right at uh, the peak is at eight hertz. So this means that we have done enough things right, that, and we have managed to constrain our model so that uh, even though we provide it with low frequency stimulation that is random, the intrinsic um, sort of harmonic uh, oscillatory frequency of the model matches exactly the, value that the values that have been reported uh, in the biological literature. Um, and so then the question is, did we just get lucky or, OK, I need to hurry up. So the question is, did we just get lucky? Or um, is there some ways to really probe how this oscillation occurs? So we've conducted a number of manipulations of the network where we turn off some uh, interneuron types. We change their dynamics so they're all the same, so we don't have any all of this diversity. And it turns out this is very non-trivial to get this um, biophysical oscillation. Uh, so we, we actually know from experimental literature that has disabled certain kinds of neurons that you really do need all the diversity and all the different time constants provided by these neurons uh, in order to, to achieve this oscillation. Uh, and then further, then the next step was to actually simulate realistic input that uh, occurs during locomotion. The input we provided is in the form of grid cell activity. Grid cells were identified in this paper, which later got the Nobel Prize in physiology. But the idea is that as the animal is running around some uh, place, certain cells are active on a hexagonal grid with particular spacing. We created a mathematical model of these uh, grid cells and then fed that. We simulated a trajectory and then fed that into the model. And now the oscillation, there's not really a single peak. There's multiple peaks, but they're all in the theta range. So we can show even though now uh, the input is much more complex and structured, uh, of course we are going to have also more varied oscillatory powers, but they're still in the theta range. So we must have constrained the model enough to to achieve this biophysically realistic behavior. Uh, just a couple of words about simulation performance on blue waters. Uh, before we got our blue waters allocation, we were using Comet in San Diego. It was taking about 17 hours uh, using the maximum allowed number of nodes, uh, 1680 cores, I believe. Um, with blue waters, uh, it actually takes about three hours for the same simulation on, of course, 16,000 cores, which is, it's a large allocation, but it's not so many for blue waters. So this has really significantly improved our workflow. Most importantly, the actual realistic, spatial realistic simulations, uh, they need to be much longer because uh, to simulate the animal, we need at least 10 seconds of physical time simulation. That is only possible on blue waters currently. Uh, it takes 12 hours to simulate 10 seconds of, sim of physical time, which is it's long, but it's okay, and we can always increase the number of cores. So this this really has made possible uh, some some really interesting work. Uh, am I out of time? Yep. <laughs> okay, this is our second model, which is work in development, but uh, 
it also is currently starting to produce biophysically relevant behavior, dynamic behavior. Uh, and on blue, on blue orders, actually, it runs out of memory on all other clusters. So on blue orders, this model takes three hours for 250 milliseconds. So it's it's pretty hungry for computing power. This model has uh, over a million neurons, so it requires a lot more processing power. But it, this wouldn't have been possible to run at all without blue orders. Uh, and these are just some of our simulation data sets that have been released in public databases because not everybody has access to blue orders. But our data can be analyzed by other groups and can be checked for validity. We've released our model called on ModelDB, which is uh, the major uh, code sharing website used by neuroscientists. And finally, the conclusion is that Blue Waters has made possible neural simulations at unprecedented scale that nobody else has done so far. And uh, this is our lab, all the people who have helped in some way. Most of these are experimentalists, some of the computational modeling graduate students. And I wish to thank, of course, Blue Waters, uh, the NSF PRAC uh, program. Uh, we've used some of the Exceed clusters for our simulations. Of course, the Blue Waters team has, has uh, provided tremendous technical assistance. Um, and we also interacted with the HDF group to convert our wor workflow to HDF. And that is all I have. <laughs>